This is Dr. Howard Strassler speaking to you today on Popal Protection, Bases, Liners, Sealers, Carries Control, uh, Module Basic Concepts. Uh, this lecture is part of four different modules that relate to Popal Protection. Uh, the readings uh, for this lecture are from uh, the Summit Textbook Chapters 5, 6, and 8. Uh, when we consider popal protection, uh, we're really considering uh, how do we maintain popal health uh, and the considerations for popal health and the placement of our restorative materials. Uh, first, we need to understand what compromises uh, can occur to popal health, what can cause popal irritation, uh, popal inflammation, uh, and uh, within what we're doing and what we see in terms of condition, uh, carries uh, is the primary reason we see uh, popal inflammation, popal irritation. Uh, carries, uh, basically the bacterial infection, uh, causes popal inflammation. Now at the same time when you're preparing teeth, either due to carious lesions, removing defective restorations, uh, that our rotary preparation can cause heat and trauma to the odontoblastic processes and can cause some popal distress it can cause uh, pulpal irritation and uh, uh, pulpal uh, inflammation and actually lead to postoperative pain after a restorative procedure. Uh, our primary goal when we're restoring teeth is to preserve pulpal health. Uh, and the techniques that we use, uh, the removal of caries, uh, completely removing it uh, in areas that uh, will not lead to a pulpal exposure or uh, if caries is present and pulpal exposure is possible, uh, the considerations towards endodontic treatment or pulp capping, uh, preserving pulpal health uh, through the use of uh, adequate air water spray uh, when we're preparing the tooth, not desiccating the tooth. And in fact, when we restore the tooth, uh, the goal is to create a barrier, a seal of the enamel and dentin with the restorative materials we're placing. Uh, as a seal to any external irritation that could be occurring. Uh, and when we're restoring the tooth, we're also trying to seal any potential marginal gaps between the tooth and the restoration. Uh, to have pulpal health, you must have a pulp that's still vital. And in fact, if you're not uh, sure if a pulp is still vital, uh, you should do some pulpal testing, vitality testing, to verify the health of the pulp. You need to question the patient as to whether the tooth has been symptomatic or not, and then uh, more information about the symptomatology. Uh, when we talk about pulpal vitality testing, you'll learn in your endodontic course that uh, you can do a, a cold test using a cotton applicator using ethyl chloride uh, as a cold test, or you can do an electric pulp test using a specialized device that uh, uh, allows you to place controlled current on a tooth uh, and a vital pulp will respond as you're uh, seeing the settings change uh, as they're uh, changing on the device. Now, uh, when we talk about pulpal vitality testing, uh, uh, when you're administering local anesthesia, you can use pulpal vitality testing to uh, verify that the pulp is numb before you do your restorative material. And typically I'll do that with a cold test using a cotton applicator uh, that has ethyl chloride on it. So before we start a cavity preparation, uh, the radiograph provides a window so that we can see and know what to expect uh, in terms of our final pulpal depth. And making uh, possible and probable decisions about pulpal health. When we take a look at this radiograph on the upper left hand side, you can see uh, the caries is quite significant. The leading edge of the caries is uh, bordering to within a, a millimeter of the pulp. And typically, radiographic caries uh, doesn't show us the full leading edge and caries proceeds further. If you look at the clinical image for this tooth when it's been prepared, you can see the caries is significantly deeper. In fact, look at where the axial wall is relative to the pulp uh, chamber, the pulp uh, root canal itself. Uh, we're much closer. Uh, this dentin in this area, uh, if it's hard, 
uh, we don't need to continue removing it. Uh, if the caries is soft and sticky, uh, we need to make decisions concerning pulp capping uh, at a later time, and we'll talk about the issues of pulp capping. Uh, and these are decisions, decisions regarding future pulpal health, whether or not the tooth will need endodontic treatment, root canal therapy. So we're going to make decisions uh, about the use of sealers, liners, uh, and or bases in a circumstance. Uh, we make those decisions based upon the remaining dent and thickness in the tooth, uh, the thermal conductivity of a restorative material. Metallic restorative materials are far more thermal conductive than our composites and our ceramics. If we look at this clinical preparation of the mandibular second premolar, uh, what you'll notice is that on the distal axial wall we have a very deep preparation. Uh, and consideration must be given to uh, what sort of liners will we need to use to provide some level of pulpal protection. Uh, and so we need to evaluate uh, the pulpal health. And in both clinical cases you've just seen, uh, we can see where the axial wall was ending, that when we look at a radiograph we can see that the uh, that our axial wall is very close to the pulp. We can't give a dimension. We can't say it's half a millimeter or a millimeter because uh, the x-ray is just giving us a, a picture, a window on what's happening. But uh, before we start these preparations, when we know that the preparation will end up being very close to the pulp, oh, we're going to ask the patient some questions. We're going to do a pulpal health evaluation. We're going to ask the patient whether they've had uh, presence or absence of pulpal symptoms, pain to different uh, stimuli. Uh, are they having sensitivity due to thermal changes, hot and cold beverages, uh, uh, breathing in air? Uh, do sweets cause any problems? Uh, uh, when they're brushing their teeth, uh, is the dentin sensitive? If you have recession on the facial surface, uh, you may be able to, uh, with toothbrushing or flossing, actually stimulate the dentin and have a sharp pain. Uh, is the tooth sensitive to occlusion? When they bite on it, does it hurt? And that may be indicative of a tooth that uh, has pulpal inflammation, but it also may be indicative of a tooth that may have a vertical uh, fracture. Uh, if they are having symptoms, if they are having pain, and keep in mind when patients have pulpal symptoms, it's to pain. The nerve fibers within the pulp can only uh, appreciate that there's pain. That's what it communicates to the brain. It can't say, oh, that must be cold, or that must be hot, or that's air. Uh, all that someone knows is that, uh, th that they're having pain in the tooth. In fact, preparing a tooth without profound pulpal anesthesia, the patient's going to feel pain. Uh, even though what they're in fact uh, uh, experiencing is a tactile touching of the burr to the tooth. Uh, they may have spontaneous pain. A patient who says, uh, that tooth kept me up all night. It hurt. Uh, I didn't eat or drink anything, but it was just hurting. Well, that's telling you something about the pulpal status and whether or not the tooth will need endodontic treatment. And then you want to find out the type of pain. Is it a sharp pain? Uh, it hurt, oh, and I jumped, or it was a throbbing pain. I could feel it just radiating down my jaw. That all of these types of pain uh, help us in our endodontic diagnosis. You'll be learning more about endodontic diagnosis in uh, your second year endodontic course. So let's uh, make decisions about how we handle uh, the depth of our cavity preparation and what sort of linings we have. Uh, and we define cavity preparation based upon the remaining dentin thickness. Uh, a shallow cavity preparation is a preparation just barely into dentin, uh, what we'll refer to as an ideal depth, half a millimeter into dentin. Or when doing posterior composite restorations, uh, we can leave uh, some enamel on pulpal walls. But uh, typically for amalgam, uh, we're going to be half a millimeter into dentin. That's a shallow cavity preparation. That's ideal depth. Uh, a moderate cavity preparation, uh, basically we have dentin over the pulp of uh, between one and two millimeters. We make that decision, that judgment, based upon the radiograph. And we're not using a periapical radiograph, but rather we're going to use a bite wing radiograph to make that decision. 
A deep cavity preparation means that the preparation is going to extend with less than a millimeter of dentin remaining over the pulp. Keep in mind, older patients uh, have reactive reparative dentin formed. The pulp chamber, the pulp itself, is becoming smaller so that we're not looking at the preparation in terms of being deep relative to the cavo surface margin, but relative to the pulp itself. And so uh, when we define moderate and deep cavity preparations, we're defining them based upon the remaining dentin over the pulp as compared to a shallow preparation refers to the depth of the preparation relative to the dentin itself. We've gone through the enamel and we're barely into dentin. And so here we're looking at a shallow cavity preparation on a radiograph. This is a bite wing radiograph that's been cropped. You can see that the pulp is a significant distance away from the restorative material, the composite resin that's been placed. This preparation is ideal. It's half a millimeter into dentin. Uh, now when we look at the uh, uh, mandibular uh, first and second molars, uh, these are preparations that are somewhat deeper and that we have about a millimeter to two millimeters uh, of preparation over the pulp and you can see uh, for the mandibular first molar and once again this is a cropped bite wing and that's why you don't see the opposing arch uh, you can see that a base a liner has been placed in this preparation that the pulp is, and here we're looking at the mesiobuccal pulp horn, is about a millimeter to two millimeters away from that restoration. So this is a preparation of moderate depth. Uh, in this radiograph, we can see that the base itself is almost to the pulp. There's barely any dentin between the pulp uh, and the base that's been placed. This is a deep cavity preparation with less than a millimeter uh, over the remaining dentin. Uh, this base is almost to the pulp. And radiographically, I'd like you to notice this is an amalgam restoration. Uh, the amalgam has a white opaque appearance versus our base material, our resin modified glass ionomer, uh, has more of a radiolucent appearance. In fact, it looks more like dentin uh, when we look at it. So what causes pulpal inflammation? Well, pulpal inflammation can be caused by bacterial toxins penetrating uh, the dentinal tubules. It means that the carious lesion has uh, penetrated through the enamel, gotten to the DEJ. Uh, the bacteria has a leading edge of toxins, of products, uh, acids, uh, that are penetrating the tubules as a leading edge uh, of the carious process. Uh, these bacteria can cause pulpal irritation and inflammation. Uh, uh, Long-standing irritation and inflammation can re re lead to an irreversible pulpitis uh, leading to uh, pulpal necrosis. Uh, bacteria at the uh, margins of a cavity preparation can cause recurrent caries. Uh, we can see inflammation of the pulp due to microleakage at the restoration tooth interface due to gaps uh, at the cable surface margin along the walls of the cavity preparation and the restorative material. Uh, trauma during tooth preparation can cause pulpal inflammation. Preparing the tooth with a high-speed handpiece without adequate air water spray, uh, adequate cooling during the uh, cavity preparation. So when we talk about bacterial penetration and pulpal inflammation, that we're looking at a gap uh, bacterial invasion between the gap between the restorative material and the cava surface margin. The bacteria are entering the tooth interface at a microscopic level, uh, entering the dentinal tubules, and uh, in this case we're looking at streptococcus mutans, uh, mutans streptococci. The bacteria are penetrating the, the gap. Uh, they're going down the, uh, uh, the uh, dentinal tubules. They're uh, causing inflammation of the odontoblastic processes until finally you see an inflammatory, localized inflammatory response uh, at that leading edge of bacterial toxins. Sometimes we see pulpal pain due to stimuli. Uh, uh, you may know that as patients who complain that when they breathe in air, uh, a tooth is sensitive, uh, they have root sensitivity. Or it could be just leakage at the gap that the restorative material isn't sealing the tooth well. Uh, it's not an inflammatory reaction. In fact, if you look at 
this uh, line drawing, what uh, we're showing as being the pulp itself, we see no inflammation. We see the mechanoreceptors uh, perceive stimuli, cold, hot, sweets, uh, air. Uh, it's pain. It goes away almost instantaneously. It doesn't linger in any way. Uh, it's postulated to be due to what we call the hydrodynamic theory. Uh, and this stimulus causes rapid fluid flow through the tubules to the nerve endings. Uh, the nerve endings become deformed, and to the patient, it's interpreted as being uh, pain. Uh, it's not a toothache. It's not an abscess. It's a stimulus response. Similar to if I took a sharp pin and stuck it uh, into your arm, you'd feel pain. But when I removed the pin, it wouldn't be hurting anymore. So it's more of a stimulus response. Uh, we can sometimes see a gap uh, at the restorative interface. Uh, uh, and uh, with this gap, uh, we perceive the stimulation. Uh, that uh, This explanation uh, gives us root sensitivity, that the dentinal tubules are exposed. Uh, in the case of root sensitivity with recession, it means that the uh, dentin's exposed. Uh, it's not covered with any restorative material, and just the tubules are open. It could be caused uh, by uh, vigorous toothbrushing with an abrasive toothpaste. It could be caused by ingesting alcohol uh, acidic beverages. It could be plaque sitting on root surfaces, starting the initial forms of caries, uh, and they're opening up the dentinal tubules, uh, giving you a stimulus response. Now, we use sealers uh, in the uh, restoration of teeth to avoid marginal gaps. Uh, most specifically, uh, the sealers like an adhesive resin. We'll be talking about biomaterials and what we use for sealers uh, in a later module. Uh, when we see marginal gaps at the restorative interface, it can lead to recurrent caries at that interface. It can lead to marginal staining. And in fact, uh, in the image to your uh, right, you can see these composite restorations is showing brown discoloration. Uh, I can take my Explorer and get into uh, a gap between the restorative material and the tooth itself. That uh, in the area I'm pointing to right now, uh, that area is sticky to an Explorer. It feels like a sharp Explorer going into a leather belt, uh, and that's recurrent caries. We sometimes see tooth sensitivity due to these marginal gaps. We'll sometimes see microleakage due to these uh, restorative interface gaps, these marginal gaps at the interface. Uh, why are teeth sensitive to thermal shock? And uh, we know teeth are sensitive to thermal shock. And our earliest memories of that thermal shock is uh, our front teeth, when we bite into uh, an ice pop. Oh, and it hurts. And it just makes your whole body cringe. Well, uh, this direct thermal shock is basically the temperature change, the cold. And generally, it's cold, not hot. Uh, it's transferred through the enamel, through the dentin to the pulp, through uh, the uh, dentin interface. We see it when we're eating something hot and cold, uh, generally cold, uh, on our thinner teeth, on our incisors. But we also see it. Uh, being transferred by metallic restorations, an all gold crown, an amalgam restoration. Uh, metallic restorations are more thermoconductive than composites, than ceramics. Uh, our liner base thickness to prevent thermal transfer in very deep cavity preparations should be uh, no, no thicker than half to seven, ten, seven, three quarters of a millimeter. Uh, thicker bases may, in fact, weaken the restoration. And so if we're going to use a liner or a base to prevent thermal transfer in metallic restorations, uh, in fact, what we'll do is we'll place them with enough thickness that uh, they'll act as an additional barrier to that thermal sensitivity. Uh, usually cold triggers that uh, thermal response. Air can trigger a response. Uh, the air evaporates saliva moisture from the tooth, creating a cooling effect. Uh, we see it on root surfaces when we see recession. Uh, we can see cold sensitivity due to a recently placed restoration being in hyperocclusion. In fact, uh, when we have a tooth that the restoration has been placed, it's high in occlusion, whether it be a composite, an amalgam, or a crown. Uh, the patient experiences cold sensitivity. In fact, you can have a lingering sensitivity to cold where the tooth just aches. No throbbing, but it just aches. 
you adjust the occlusion on the restoration and within a day that sensitivity has gone away and the pulp maintains its vitality. Leave a tooth in hyper occlusion for extended periods of time and in fact you can cause ir irreversible pulpitis and the need for endodontic treatment. So hyper occlusion, the diagnostic uh, uh, explanation is uh, uh, hyperocclusion and cold sensitivity. So if a patient comes back, they say, Doc, the filling you just did, that tooth's been really sensitive to cold. It was a composite. Maybe it was a ceramic inlay that was uh, cemented. And you look and you check the occlusion, and in fact, uh, the restoration's high. It's in hyperocclusion. Adjust the uh, occlusion, and then call the patient back several days later, and they'll tell you, oh, the tooth's calmed down. Uh, and that's typically what we'll see. Uh, uh, also, thermal uh, sensitivity that we've postulated, it, it's maybe due to uh, pulpal fluid flow, uh, the hydrodynamic theory. It's the theory that we use as it relates to uh, uh, root sensitivity that patients are buying uh, sensitivity toothpaste for. Uh, and what we have is the cavity preparation is cutting the dentin. It's removing the mineralized enamel, getting to the dentin, which has open tubules. Uh, the more dent you cut away, the more tubules you'll leave exposed. The deeper the preparation, uh, the deeper the preparation, the greater the number of tubules uh, per given surface area. Uh, in fact, the more tubules are exposed, and if you desiccate the dentin, it can lead to pulpal inflammation. So deeper preparations have more tubules open. Uh, sealing these tubules reduces sensitivity to thermal shock. Osmotic stimulation. Uh, sensitivity to sweets, uh, changes in dentin uh, fluid flow, the use of sealers, the use of adhesives, cavity varnishes help minimize that uh, uh, sensitivity due to thermal shock due to uh, dentinal tubule flow. So when we talk about materials to seal the tooth for pulpal protection, uh, one of the materials that we use is called a cavity sealer. A cavity sealer is uh, by definition, a material that's placed very thinly as a film, as a protective coating on cavity walls, creating a barrier to leakage. For amalgam, we use cavity varnish, the barrier, although the trends today for well-placed amalgams that are well-adapted, well-condensed, is there's no need for a cavity varnish. As a beginner placing amalgam restorations, it would benefit you to place the varnish uh, because uh, your adaptation of the amalgam to the cavity walls won't be as optimal in your initial restorations as it will be as you do more restorations. Uh, we use adhesives to create a, a barrier to leakage. Uh, bonding agents. We can use uh, etch and re rinse uh, resin bonding systems where we etch the tooth first and then we place an adhesive either using a Scotch bond multipurpose a fourth generation adhesive, or Optibon Solo, a fifth generation adhesive for composites. Uh, in our clinics, we also have a self etch resin bonding system uh, where the uh, bonding system itself is etching the enamel and dentin, uh, the cut and enamel and dentin. It's the Xeno 4 material. Predominantly for our composite restorations, anterior and posterior, we are using etch and rinse, using phosphoric acid first, then our bonding agent second. Uh, for sealing the tooth and providing retention to the restoration. Cavity liners, by definition, uh, are, are cements or resin coatings that of minimal thickness, generally less than half a millimeter in thickness, placed as a barrier to bacteria to provide a, a, a ther therapeutic effect, a, a pulpal sedative or antimicrobial effect, applying to cavity walls uh, adjacent to the pulp or uh, Dical or vitrobon material, dical being a calcium hydroxide. It's not adhesive, it's very soluble. We place that in generally our, our moderate and deep depth cavity preparations. Generally, I'm sorry, our deep depth cavity preparations. And vitrobon, a resin modified glass ionomer, which is adhesive. And we would always place vitrobon to cover dical when we place dical in the cavity preparation. In a later module, you'll see the techniques for placing uh, dical and vitrobond and uh, barrier as a cavity varnish.
Cavity vases uh, are used to replace missing dentin, uh, dentin replacement materials. Uh, and they're placed uh, thicker than half a millimeter, half a millimeter to one millimeter. Uh, typically, we're using it to block out undercuts and cavity preparations when we're doing inlays, onlays, or crowns. Uh, we can use Vitrobond. We can use, which is a resin-modified glass anomer uh, base and liner. We can use Fuji 2LC, which is a resin-modified uh, glass ionomer restorative, or Fuji 9, which is a conventional glass ionomer restorative. All glass ionomers are self-adhesive to dentin. We'll talk about the chemistry of how glass ionomers are uh, adhesive to dentin in a later module. Uh, in the United States, bases are not commonly used today as dentin replacements uh, for thermal insulation. Uh, their predominant use is to block out undercuts and preparations for inlays and onlays uh, for crowns. Uh, and typically, in cervical areas where uh, the tooth may have a class 5 composite that pops out, or a tooth that has cervical notching, non-carious cervical lesions, uh, class 5 lesions. Uh, you've just heard uh, a presentation on pulpal protection, bases, liners, sealers, carries control, uh, basic concepts uh, having to do with uh, cavity preparations and decision making uh, for the use uh, of pulpal protection.